Good evening, y'all. Good afternoon, buddy. We are going to be continuing and wrapping up our study tonight on demonology. And before we get into this subject, we're going to do something that we don't always do, but you know what? We probably ought to do it more. We're going to open up with prayer. And I'm going to kind of preface that with this. Last time I taught a lesson on this, that night I had terrible nightmares. Did you? And I, I'm taking that as a sign that the devil doesn't want me to talk about this sort of thing. Yep. And so I prayed about it and I said, you know what? I'm going to keep pushing forward and making him mad because this is stuff that people need to hear. And I'm not necessarily saying that those nightmares were of a, de a demonic nature, but you know, you never know. You never know. And so we're going to pray about it. We're going to ask the Lord to bless us, to watch over us, and to watch over everybody that hears this. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, and we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word and to have fellowship with one another. We pray, God, for everybody here, everybody uh, meeting with this church. We pray, Lord, that you will bless us as we study. We pray that you will watch over us, God. Send your angels to reinforce us on a daily basis so we can fulfill your will in our lives. And we pray, God, that you will be with everyone that's listening, God. I pray that you will deliver them from any spiritual bondage that they're currently in. I pray, God, that you will speak truth into their lives and that you will draw them unto yourself. For those who are believers, I pray, God, that this will be an edifying study, a reminder of what we have in you, that we are secure in your promise. I pray, God, that you will... Give me the words to say and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to start our study tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And just to review a tad little bit, we talked about how there are different approaches to spiritual warfare. And the continuationist approach or the Pentecostal approach uh, is what I would deem a seeking approach. You know, you're on the lookout uh, and, and not even just on the lookout, you're actively seeking demonic activity to deliver people from it. I mean, there are whole ministries that revolve around this. They're known as deliverance ministries. That's a seeking approach. I personally believe that the more biblical approach is a standing approach. I call it that because of Ephesians chapter 6. So it talks about us to stand in the Lord, mm. to stand, 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 repeats it multiple times because we, as we go on the Great Commission, as we share the gospel with people, we're no doubt going to come under spiritual attack. And there are already people who are coming under spiritual attack. The devil doesn't want people to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you're going to run into stuff like that. And whenever you do, as we talked about in our last lesson, and I encourage you to go back and listen to it if you haven't already, what we should do is give it to God and pray for people to be delivered. If we suspect that there is demonic activity taking place, of course, like we mentioned, there are lots of different disorders, both mental and physical, uh, that might seem demonic on the surface, but they could be something completely medical. Okay. I, I don't know. Um, only God does. But if we suspect something demonic is taking place, then we should do what we should already be doing. And that is praying without ceasing and lifting up these people, and asking God to deliver them. And like with the example in Jude, verse 9, talks about Michael when the devil gets in the way. right? Michael was not commissioned to oppose the devil. He was commissioned to take care of the, the body of Moses. But the devil got in the way. The devil contested with him about the body of Moses. And Michael gives it over to God and says, The Lord rebuke you. And so if the devil gets in our way, Rather than attempting to engage the devil and bind the devil, we should hand it over to God and pray in the name of Jesus that he take care of that situation. And so we're trusting not in our own power, not trusting in our own authority. We're trusting in the authority of Jesus. Um, and so prayer is the way we stand in our faith. And that's how the armor of God talked about in Ephesians 6 wraps up. It talks about praying in the end. In fact, many people in studying the army of God, or not army, sorry, armor of God, um, have noted that the spear, which was so important in the Roman war, mm. um, <coughs> it's not mentioned there. So it mentions all these other aspects that a Roman legionnaire uh, would wear in his armor, but it doesn't mention the spear. And 
many people note that prayer is the spear. So that's the way we uh, handle the devil is through prayer. But anyways, we're going to look now at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And the main question we're answering tonight, and in a way this is a simple question. I think it's a simple question. Other people would disagree with me. But uh, the question is whether or not a Christian can be demon-possessed. And so I already told you what I believe last time we had a lesson on this subject, but I want to let God's word speak for itself. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to start in verse number 15. It says this, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are brought, sorry, bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so the main text here that we're looking at, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, um, verses 19 and 20 are the verses that I want to call your attention to. It says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the word for temple here refers to the holy place. So the naos in Greek refers to the inner portion of the temple where God resided. Um, the Holy of Holies, if you will. And so 1 Corinthians 6 indicates this New Testament principle that whenever a believer is saved, the Holy Spirit uh, dwells with them, inside them. Uh, I personally believe this was a New Covenant distinctive. I don't think that this happened in the Old Testament. Uh, I believe that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was only given after Pentecost. But it's certainly something that takes place today. So the naos is a holy place where only God dwells. And now we ourselves um, are a naos. We ourselves are a temple in which God dwells with our spirit. And so one has to ask this question when we're discussing whether or not demons can possess Christians is, will God allow a demon to enter the holy of holies? Mm. Will God permit an unclean spirit? Because that's what they're often called in the New Testament. Will he permit an unclean spirit to enter the Holy of Holies? And I would say the answer is pretty clear. It's no. So in the Old Testament, just to give you an idea about how serious God is about keeping his holy place secure from defilement, there was a king, actually a pretty godly king, but you know, no one's perfect as we know. His name was King Uzziah, and he went into the holy place to offer incense there. He was told that that was off limits by the priest, but he did it anyways. God, to teach Uzziah a lesson, struck him down with leprosy, and he was separated from everybody else the rest of his life until he died. And so while Uzziah was a godly man and no doubt a believer, even he was not allowed to go into the holy place and defile it. When in the Old Testament, that was against the law. So that gives you an idea about how serious God is about the holy place. Now, if the body of a Christian is the holy place, can we imagine God putting up with a demon? Now, if God didn't put up with a godly king, Uzziah, mm. okay, who was a believer entering into the holy place and struck him down with leprosy, do you think that he's going to put up with a demon entering the right. holy place? I think the answer to that is no. Um, and so I'm not the first person to make this argument. Um, there's a really good study by uh, Robert Dean Thomas. He's got a really good website ministry called Dean Bible Ministries. I'd encourage you to check that out. And uh, He has an extensive study on this specific subject. But that's one of the main points that he makes is that if we are the holy place and God does not permit anything unclean in it, then that means that a demon would not be permitted to enter a believer. Uh, now, fornication is something that, according to this text, 
um, is definitely testing God's patience because you are the temple of the Lord and you are committing sin with it. Mm -hmm. So that should show you how serious this is. And of course, uh, divine discipline is something that is already addressed in this book of first Corinthians and uh, in first Corinthians 11, verse 32, it mentions the people who were actually struck dead by God, even though they were believers. Right. So <clears throat> engaging in bodily sin, okay, for a believer in the New Testament is serious because your body is the temple of the Lord. But that is more external. The idea of a demon going inside the temple, okay, where the Holy Spirit resides and God and a demon being roommates. Um, I think that anybody who really follows that train of thought will see how repugnant that is. And since God has made a covenant with us, then we can be assured that that's not going to happen. But I want to prove that further, obviously. So let's look at some other verses tonight. So let's look at Mark chapter 3, verse 27. This gives us another biblical principle that helps us answer this question. Because the Bible doesn't really address it directly, right? I mean, Paul doesn't write to any of the churches and say, okay, this question obviously is something that, mm. you know, y'all have been asking. So let me go ahead and answer it. He doesn't answer the question. And I think that he probably doesn't address it because it wasn't necessary. It wasn't right. I mean, I think that people probably already knew that Christians couldn't be possessed by demons. So he didn't need to talk about it, but um, that's neither here nor there. Let's look at Mark chapter three, verse 27. So it says, this is Jesus speaking. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. So Jesus makes it very clear, and this is in the context, by the way, of casting out demons. Uh, in verse 22, it says, The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils casteth he out devils. And so he's saying that he is capable of casting out devils, because he is binded or bound rather the strong man, the strong man in this case refers to the devil. So he's able to plunder the kingdom of Satan. But uh, that leads to this question of who is our strong man. So, I, I mean, we have no ability to withstand a demon. I mean, when we consider the power of demons, there's no way that I, ever I could go toe to toe with a demon and come out standing. Right. But thankfully I have a paraclete, I have a counselor, uh, a high priest who stands between me and the demonic realm. And that's my strong man. And that strong man is Jesus. So he is our strong man. And so the key is if a demon was to possess a Christian and plunder the house, so to speak, mm -hmm. to enter into the house and take advantage of that situation, they would have to first bind Jesus or Jesus would have to leave. Those are your two options. That's it. So since binding Jesus is impossible for us to imagine because he's all powerful and that can't happen. There's only one other option that he would leave the believer. Mm. And that's something that may not be a problem for perhaps a Pentecostal uh, denomination who believes that salvation can be lost and the Holy spirit can leave somebody. Mm. Okay. But if we're looking at this from the perspective of eternal security, and we've defended that, you know, on other podcasts, but if the Holy Spirit seals us to the day of redemption, as it says in Ephesians 430. So how long are we sealed till the day of redemption? Right. And that hasn't happened yet. That's when Jesus comes back, the redemption of our bodies. So if the, if the devil has to either bind Jesus, which can't happen, or Jesus leaves and, and Jesus is not going to leave because he's already promised the Holy Spirit will reside in us till the day of redemption. You really have no way of saying that a demon could possess a Christian because either the Holy Spirit, God would have to be bound or God would have to, to, to abandon a Christian to that, mm. which would imply the Holy Spirit leaves the house and leaves it vacant for a demon to come in and take advantage of it. And since either of those possibilities are ruled out by the new Testament, um, again, that furnishes more evidence that demons cannot possess Christians. So, um, and then two verses down, about yes. the blas blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> try to get my, my question in order here, but so 
what I guess what he's saying here is, unless, of course, he blasphemes the Holy Spirit, he never has forgiveness, which means, of course, he doesn't, he doesn't accept Christ as his Savior. Right? Yeah, so, so in the case of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, uh, that, that particular sin in this case was saying of Jesus' power that it was demonic. So that was hardened unbelief. That wasn't just unbelief. That wasn't like being on the fence. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Like that was saying, there's no way Jesus could be the Messiah. There's no proof that could ever convince He's a me. Demon. He's a demon. He could do anything at this point. Right. And they would attribute it to the demonic. <laughs> if you, if you commit that sin, it's not that the sin is unforgivable in the sense that if you stop committing that sin, sure. God wouldn't forgive you. It's just that you've reached the point of no return. Essentially. Like what could God do to convince you? If you cannot believe the evidence before your eyes, then what could convince you? Nothing, really. Right. I mean, other than coming into God's kingdom and being brought to your knees when every knee bows and every tongue confesses, there's nothing that could convince you in this world, in right. this life. And God's not going to force anybody to believe. So he gave them plenty of evidence. They simply hardened their hearts to where uh, forgiveness was inaccessible. It's like Sodom, was it Sodom and Gomorrah would, would have believed if they yes, seen... yes. And I think we, <clears throat> we've talked about, we that have talked about yeah. that. It's been a while, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that, um, there are different levels of hardness of heart. Sure. And the Pharisees, they were more hardened in their rebellion mm -hmm. than even Sodom and Gomorrah, which is saying something. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. So let's, uh, now look at Matthew 12. Cause going right along with this, Jesus talks about this generation, this generation that commits the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He talks about it again in terms of demon possession. Um, it says in verse number 43, so we'll, we'll start there. Matthew 12, 43, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Now this unclean spirit is clearly driven out. An unclean spirit doesn't willingly leave a house. Okay, scripture seems to depict them as desperately seeking a mm. house to inhabit. So once they're there and comfortable, they don't leave. Unless, of course, they're cast out. Now, Jesus did cast out demons in his ministry. So what's sad is, instead of fixing the root problem, uh, they just had the symptom of dressed. Jesus would have fixed the root problem for them but they simply didn't do anything about it. So let's see what else is said in verse 44. Then the demon saith, I will return into mine house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty and swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so, it shall be also unto this wicked generation. So uh, apparently what is being described here is people that are so hardened in their heart in unbelief that Jesus casts out demons, the demons leave. But the demons over time, I don't know how long, it could be weeks, it could be months, maybe even years. But the demon comes back to this person that it once inhabited. And the person has an empty house. There's no guard standing watch over it. So just as it was easy to occupy before because there was no guard, there's no guard now. And so the demon is able to come in, not just with himself, but also with his buddies. You have a question, Alyssa? Sure. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I've heard that. Your your mom shared that with me before. But uh, there was a witch doctor in Papua New Guinea who was delivered from demonic possession, received Jesus as his savior, and later on um, experienced, I guess, what was it a dream or a vision of some sort? Yeah. But demons apparently tried to re-enter this man, and they were unable to do so because... They said uh, there's what light in him. I think yes. that's what it was. So, but they recognize the presence of God. They recognize this man as being a temple and inside the temple is God. And that's off limits. So that brings us to this next question. Um, can they externally attack believers? Yes. Um, there's nothing to rule that out. Um, I don't think that necessarily, um, 
that's something that we have to be worried about. I don't think that it's no. maybe common, but it can happen. I mean, we have the story of Job. Mm -hmm. So Job was a righteous man, a believer. And so the devil didn't possess him, but God did give Satan permission to externally attack him, but it was permissive. Mm -hmm. Okay. It wasn't something the devil could just do. It was something God had to permit. Now in Job's case, it was a test. Um, how often does God do this? We simply don't know. Um, I, I personally believe that God will allow us to be tested, but I don't think that that test is meant to reflect upon our perfect us. Yes. I'm trying to find the words. I don't think it reflects upon some sin in our life that we have because no. Job didn't have some peculiar sin. So, uh, there was an end to it, right? I mean, there was a time where God's like, all right, that's enough. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he restored back to Job, his health and, and so many other things that he had lost. But, um, God can permit that. But as far as demon possession, like a demon, be able to enter somebody, affect their mind, affect their spiritual condition and even control them from the mm. inside out that is ruled out by scripture. So as far as the external thing, I don't think that we would probably be able to recognize it necessarily as demonic. Job did. And he didn't automatically say, all right, this is the devil, the devil, mm. devil did it. You know, he got sick, very mm -hmm. sick. And uh, so apparently the devil does have the ability to uh, afflict people externally, but we shouldn't assume that. All right. We shouldn't assume that just because someone's sick, that they're being afflicted by the devil. I think there's so many things, guys, that when we get to heaven, hindsight's going to be 2020. We're going to look back and we're going to see how God was at work. Mm. Okay. That, oh, that's a time where demons were, uh, were, you know, whispering in my ear and yeah. trying to discourage me. And here's a time where the angels came and, and they drove them away. And I remember that encouragement. I felt that was, that was spiritual warfare. All that stuff's going to be made clear. So we need to be careful about making assumptions now when we simply don't know, but Ryland, do you have something you're going to say? Yeah. Um, you know, I can I can agree with you on that one. Like, I do kind of believe that Christians can be afflicted externally from demonic stuff because I have remembered a couple times I would just be sitting in the quiet by myself and I would hear something say something to me. Like, at one time, I was sitting on my bed just looking at my phone and I heard my name called. And at first, I thought it was my mom, like, just in the bathroom, like, mm -hmm. like she wasn't in the room or whatnot. I, I have definitely heard something. I don't know if it would be anything demonic. Or could have been Jesus. Could have been Jesus, yeah. Could've and, and you know, and there there are yeah. times where, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll share this with you. I'm not going to give you all the details because I don't think it's necessary. But uh, my mom and um, her siblings, when they were still in their parents' house back in, this was in the 80s, but um, they hadn't all graduated yet. They're still living in the same home. And this was a time where my, my grandparents will, will tell me that they weren't very dedicated to the Lord. Like mm. they're believers. They raised their kids up in church, but this was a time where they were partying. The kids really weren't well-established. Mm. Um, and they look back on that life and realize they were, they were living carnally, you know, but, um, it was during that time in their life when they had a lot of spooky episodes happen at their home. Um, and, that sort of thing stopped after they got involved in church again. Mm. Not, not just like going to church, you know, like, you know, punching in your time card, that sort of thing. But when they started turning their life around for the Lord, that is when they stopped seeing these, these things take place. But I mean, they saw apparitions, um, uh, voices again, mm. they heard voices where nobody was there. Um, my Nana, for example, she heard the door open and close. She heard footsteps going up the stairs she said, is that you, Tisha? That's my mom's name. And so she said, is that you, Tisha? And she heard a response like, yeah, it's me. Clear as day. I mean, it wasn't even a whisper. Mm. It was loud enough for her to hear it downstairs. And so uh, she continued to go about her business. Well, then she hadn't heard anything else upstairs. So she went upstairs and she looked and there's no sign of anybody there. And then she came back downstairs and uh, all of a sudden she heard car pull up in the driveway and uh, my mom got out of the car with my aunt Wendy wow. and maybe they were with a friend or something like that. And uh, they were like, well, did, did you go back out? Like I just heard you here not too long. It was maybe about 30 minutes ago or so. And, and she said, mom, we haven't been here. We were, we were shopping. 
And she was like, whoa. All right, because she heard her daughter's voice. It wasn't just anybody. Mm-hmm. And so, and that, and that happened along with other things at the same time. So it wasn't just an isolated incident. So I think that's a, an illustration of the fact that demons can't oppress. They can instill fear. But again, there's a line that God has drawn that they can't step over. Right. And so they can inch close and close. Now, the closest that they can get is not necessarily what God will always permit. All right. There are times where I feel like I've been oppressed. And then there are times where I turned to God in prayer and he delivered me from the oppression. And it was like the demons that maybe were closer. They got shoved back. It was like an angel said, all right, get out of his face. All right. God said, that's enough for now. Mm. And so, again, those times I think that God, he can test our faith. It draws us to him. It brings us to our knees. It teaches us that we need him. We need to depend upon him more. Um, And so God, again, he he uses that to discipline us. But uh, as far as can a demon enter into us and uh, take possession of us? Possession implies property. And we are bought with a price, as Paul has said, as the word of God says. So we don't belong to demons anymore. So they have no legal right over us. Uh, While, you know, like I said, God can permit so much, okay? There is a point where he will say, no, they're my child. You can't touch them spiritually. You cannot enter into this house because he stands guard. And so that's so encouraging to me that he's my strong man, that he dwells in, in me. And that's why we need to look at 1 John uh, 4, 4 and 1 John 5, 4. These are really important verses. And, you know, predictably, I know that if you're listening to this and you've studied this topic before, these verses come up. Some people would say they're taken out of context. Uh, context. I disagree. I think that they're in the exact context that we are discussing right now. Um, in so first John four, four, it says ye are of God, little children and have overcome them. Overcome who? Well, in verse three, it says every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is Christ is sorry, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already it is in the world. So we are talking about demonic deception in this case. Okay. At the very least. But in verse four, it says, you're of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is he that in the world? The devil. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if you want to make that 100% transparent, just look at uh, chapter five, verse four, as we're about to. But here it says, we've already overcome them. Now, there is a practical type of overcoming, which, like I said, that's, you know, going to God in prayer, that's submitting to the rule of the Holy Spirit in our life. But as far as our position all right, the Holy Spirit being inside us, being born again and being in this holy place where, you know, no one can go that's mm-hmm. unclean. All right, that is something that's already been done. It's already um it's already established. Yeah. We have already overcome. So in 1 John 5, 4, let's read here. It says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So when do you become a holy place? When do you receive the Holy Spirit and become exempt from that spiritual bondage known as possession? It's when you believe in Jesus for the first time. And if you've ever done that, then you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. And final verse in uh, 1 John, verse 19, maybe this is the clearest one there is. Um, Sorry, verse 18, I typed that wrong in my notes. Uh, 1 John 5, 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And this is referring to us being holy. We've been washed and pure. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now, this is referring, uh, there are different takes on this, but this is referring to the fact that uh, when he says he keepeth himself, he is kept sequestered in this holy place. So, you know, God dwells inside us. And the Holy Spirit wraps himself around us and the devil can't get past that. It literally says right here that the devil cannot touch the one who is begotten of God. Mm. And so if you're begotten of God, the devil can't touch you spiritually. Now, physically, externally, like I said, that's something else altogether. But in terms of your spirit, okay, your spirit is in the holy place and safe and the devil cannot bind you. He would have to bind God. And he can't do that. 
or God would have to abandon us, and he's promised he won't do that, and he never changes his mind once he makes a promise, okay, because God cannot lie. And so 1 John 5, 19 is probably one of my favorite verses in, in this particular topic because um, it, it says it plain right there, he can't touch us. Not only can he not bind us, he can't even touch us. He can't affect us on that level. Uh, he can sure send his soldiers, his minions, to whisper discouragement. He can tempt us. He can try to make us stumble. And if God does permit, there can be external attack as well. But he cannot go beyond that point uh, because we have already overcome. Now, um, let's look at a couple other instances in Scripture, or rather just one more instance, um, the instance of Saul. Okay, so Saul is usually the go-to when you're discussing <clears throat> demonic possession in the Old Testament. He's the one who always comes up because the New Testament, we have tons of examples of demonic possession. Uh, we already talked about that that was probably uh, a, a unique outpouring of demonic activity in the first century. I still think it happens today, but it seems like it was on steroids mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago. In the Old Testament, we really don't see a whole lot of that, right? We have one instance, Saul. Saul, in uh, 1 Samuel, it mentions that he was uh, externally affected by an unclean, evil spirit. But it does not say that the demon entered him. Right. It says that the demon came upon him, and it says that the demon left him. So came on and came off. Uh, that appears that because the Holy Spirit had been removed from Saul, he was now subject to demonic oppression. <laughs> But the fact that the demon does not enter Saul makes me suspect that Saul was a believer. Okay, so some people would disagree, but we know Saul started out well. He started out as a faithful king. He gave credit to God. Just read the first chapters about his kingship. But over time, he started letting his guard down spiritually until eventually God took the Holy Spirit away from him. Now, the Holy Spirit had not indwelled Saul. Again, this is something different from the New Testament. The impermanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit inside a believer was something given after Pentecost. Uh, so the Holy Spirit had been poured upon Saul so that way he could be a good king. And uh, the Holy Spirit was not uh, effectively taken away from him until after he sinned against God and uh, refused to annihilate the Amalekites. Once the Holy Spirit was taken away from him, even then, though, there's a line that a demon apparently is not able to cross. He doesn't enter Saul. And he doesn't stay in Saul. He comes upon him and he leaves. And he comes upon him and he leaves. So in the Old Testament, even though people were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, I still think that God had drawn a line. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm going to read you a verse that I think pertains to this. So even if he did not enter into people, the Holy Spirit that is, um, I still think that there was a special protection given to believers. Uh, in Psalm 34, 7, it says, The angel of the Lord, which is a reference to the Son of God, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. He encamps round about them. So I may be pressing this a little too far in the minds of some people, but instead of being inside and dwelling people like we see in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord would encamp around people. So the reason that they couldn't be the temples of the Lord yet is because the blood of Jesus hadn't been shed, mm -hmm. but because they were justified, there was still a barrier between the believer and the demon. So the demon could affect that believer like the demon affects Saul. But even then, it was temporary, and it wasn't as far as one could imagine the demon going, okay, all the way inside the believer, uh, which is clearly not what happened in Saul's case. So uh, in the Old Testament, I don't believe that Christians could be demon-possessed either. Um I believe that all throughout history, those who have believed in Jesus and have been justified are exempt from that attack. And I think the New Testament just makes it um, all the more clear because we have additional references to the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer there. So anyways, last thing that I want to mention, and then we'll uh, wrap it up because this is that final question that we wanted to look at and Hopefully this has been a blessing to you if you've listened to this series on demonology. It's made some things clear, I hope. But uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I want to read this here because this is so important. This is a principle that I live by. 
And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So verse number six, above that which is written, not to think of men above that which is written. Um, in the KJV here, the words of men are in italics. And why I haven't looked at this uh, in the Greek, uh, that would be not to think above that which is written. Uh, some translations render it beyond, not to go beyond that which is written. Now, of course, in this particular case, in 1 Corinthians 4, he's not talking about demon possession, okay? But the principle remains the same no matter what topic we're discussing. Um, the word of God is our ultimate authority, and it's the final say whenever we're answering questions like this. So whenever somebody says, well, I think that Christians can be demon-possessed because I've heard these stories, well, they're opposite stories. Right. I mean, we just had one that was mentioned earlier about the witch doctor in Papua New Guinea right. who was you know, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and demons couldn't come back. So you have conflicting data coming from the mission field, okay? Mm -hmm. So whenever you have contradictory information like that, the only thing that can settle the question is the Bible. And if the Bible has given us enough information to say that Christians can't be demon-possessed like I believe that it has, then that's our final say in authority, not what people have felt or experienced or even seen, um, because we know that looks can be deceiving. But the thing in, in PNG, actually I don't think it was PNG, I think it was in South America, but anyways... Um, the thing that happened there proved the Bible. Yes, absolutely. Right. And, and, but again, that, that confirmation implies that statements had already been made in scripture. Yes. And, and so that lines right up with it. Yes. That says exactly what we should expect to see on the field, right? Because the Bible's already spoken on the matter. Yes. And so, uh, but that's the point that I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that experiences are worthless. Obviously I'm not saying that. Um, I'm just saying that the Bible has to be our foundation yes. and everything's built on that. And uh, if you ever find in your theology that it's the opposite, that what you think, what you feel, what you experience comes before the word of God, and, you got a problem. Yeah. And, and you're and wrong. You're, you're wrong. Right. And, and over the years, I'm going to be honest with you. There have been times where God has, he's really worked on me and he's shown me nobody go back to the Bible. And I would think of men above that, which is written and that I would say, well, I'm of this guy's camp. You know, I followed this commentary. You know, I think, this guy's got it right. right. And, I, and I would even be boxed into theological system. It's like you're either Calvinist or you're Armenian. You know, you had to pick one. And now I've gotten to a place where I don't even like to apply terms to myself. Yeah. I mean, Christian, I'll apply that to myself. Yeah. Born again believer. Yes. Amen. But uh, even when it comes to the word, for example, dispensational, if you were to ask me my beliefs on the end times and you were to diagnose, you could say like, what are you? Yeah, I'm a dispensationalist. Uh, but there's so many different views even within that camp on things, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I don't want anybody to box me in and assume things about me. If you want to know what I believe about the Bible, well, I'll tell you. Uh, but that's between me and God's word. And uh, I try my best to humble myself before the scriptures and to let God speak. That's a hard thing. I'm not saying I fully you know, got that down. I'm still working on it. But uh, that's the principle that we should live by. And that is... Uh, the principle that started the Reformation, sola mm -hmm. scriptura, it's what yep. the word of God has to say. And uh, hopefully, even if we disagree on the finer things, those who are listening to this, you can at least agree that God's word is the authority. So anyways, uh, that is going to wrap up our series on demonology and uh, listen to us on Friday because we're going to wrap up our series on healing and these topics kind of go together. So it'd be good for you to listen to that. God bless. Have a good night.